How's the shafts? In today's video, we are going to have a look at how to change a clutch plate, a pressure plate, the release bearing, or as some people call it, the throwout bearing and the spigot bearing in your vehicle. It's quite a simple procedure. Fuck off, man. But I managed to get it done, and so can you guys. The best part about this is that you can do it in your own garage with just basic tools. Basically, what we're going to do is remove the drive shaft, we're going to take out the gearbox, then we're going to take off the old clutch and the clutch assembly, we're going to put back on a new clutch assembly, pop the gearbox back in, pop the drive shaft back on, and then that's it. There's a couple of other small details, but we'll look at that in the video. Also, uh, if you are interested, there's a whole lot of other videos, uh, how to change your transmission oil, how to change differential oil, how to change your shock absorbers, and uh, those videos are all out already, so go check them out. Uh, also, following this video, the next video to come, is going to be how to change the gasket on your valve cover, and there's a couple more in the pipeline. So, welcome back to the Burden Builds Garage, let's get started. So how do you know your clutch is bad? Well, in our case, our clutch pedal was really, really difficult to push in. It's basically like doing leg day every day. And guys, I can tell you this much, if I flex this leg now, shit's just gonna go flying all over the place. So uh, it was that hard. There's a number of other little telltale signs. So maybe like your clutch is slipping or it's shuddering as, you, as you're letting it out. Uh, maybe the clutch pedal is taking a lot higher than it used to. Um, those are those are a number of telltale signs. Uh, also, if you've got high mileage, I mean, our vehicle had done like 200,000 kilometers, about 125,000 miles, so it's probably in need of a bit of replacing. Also, there's another way. Um, I, maybe you've noticed this before. If your first gear is a bit notchy, ours was a bit notchy when you when you want to put it in. It doesn't just want to slip right in, uh, the way we like it, basically. Um, I can tell you, after replacing this clutch and the whole assembly, Man, you push the clutch in and that it goes into first gear for nothing. As a side note, this specific vehicle we are working on today is a Toyota Hilux 2.7 VVTR 2006 model. Of course, it's rear wheel drive as most trucks are, but the, the methods and the procedures that we're using are gonna carry over to mostly any vehicle that is a manual, that has a manual transmission. Um, just keep this in mind. This is not a definitive guide and uh, just consult your service agent or your maintenance manual for any specific procedures that you need to follow to change out your clutch in your vehicle. Also, there's gonna be a couple of torque settings and you know various bits and pieces that you may need to check out. So make sure you do that. Please give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying this type of content and you wanna see more. If you didn't enjoy the video, you know, don't only just give it a thumbs down, let us know in the comments what you didn't enjoy. And even if you did, I suppose, just let us know what you think. Okay, so what tools are we gonna need for today's job? First up, we're gonna need a floor jack and some jack stands. And I used four jack stands in today's case, although you can get away with two. Some wheel chocks is also a good idea. Basic socket set, I used a half inch socket set. Uh, my vehicle uses the number 12, 14, and 17 spanners, although yours will probably vary. Uh, pry bar, flat screwdriver, hammer, permanent marker, a few blocks of wood. Those are for the, um, for the wheel chocks and to prop up the motor when we remove the gearbox. Uh, wire brush, a torque wrench or a torque adapter. And it also does help to have an impact wrench, and that's to remove the bolts. We generally are not gonna tighten bolts with these things. And if you are strong enough, you know, some big guns to muscle that gearbox out. So of course I use the transmission jack, you know. <laughs> I mean, does it look like I go to gym? Come now. Guys, also keep in mind that you don't wanna climb under the car when it's just jacked up with a floor jack. You wanna insert jack stands or trestles as sometimes what they are called. Um, but they are only effective if you place them under the vehicle correctly and in, in the proper manner. So keep that one in mind. So what consumables are we gonna need? Well some sandpaper, some benzene or brake clean or some like alcohol type of, uh, not the one that you drink, <laughs> some cleaning alcohol. Uh, rags, if you don't have any rags, just run up quickly to your cupboard, go fish out those 10 year old jocks that you've got, you know, the ones that are full of holes, you guys know you've still got these. Uh, you can use those and then your wife won't moan at you about having old underpants. Um, also a little bit of grease and you might also wanna wear some safety glasses and a dust mask. Uh, you know, the stuff that comes off the clutch, all the, the, the fibers and the dust from the wear, uh, that's not good to breathe in. Also not good to get in your eyes, really. Oh yeah, we're also going to need a replacement clutch kit. Now, what I used was the LUK and the model number R367MK. 
um, clutch kit, so it comes with a clutch plate, a pressure plate, a release bearing, and I had to buy the spigot bearing separately. Now, this, is, this was not an OEM part. I do prefer, mo in most cases, to use OEM parts, but in this case, it was just a little bit too expensive. Also, uh, I did take some photos to try and compare the non-OEM versus the OEM, so you guys let me know in the comments if you want to see another video uh, of the differences of these two uh, clutch kits. Uh, also, you may want to replace while you're doing this job, your rear main seal. Now, maybe it's not leaking or maybe it is. Now, I did this on a previous clutch change on a front wheel drive. So if you are, uh, or if you do want to know more about that, go check that video out. It was maybe about a year ago. Um, but while you've got the gearbox out, you might as well do this because the seal is relatively cheap as well. In today's case, I didn't do it. Um, you know, I don't know why. <laughs> it wasn't leaking. So, okay, well, let's get into it. We start off by removing the gear lever. So I'll first unscrew and remove the gear knob followed by the center console and gear lever boot. A key thing here is that the vinyl cover over the gear lever is clipped and screwed inside the center console plastic trim. So this all gets removed as one part. You'll also notice I removed a small cover just below the emergency brake lever. Don't try and pry off the gear lever cover first, you're just going to end up damaging it. The center console trim is clipped into place, so just give the back end a bit of a pull and it should pop right out. Next was to remove the rubber boot that seals the gear lever to the body of the vehicle. I did this by removing four 6mm bolts and two plastic clips. After brushing away about 15 years of dirt, I had two options. The easy way, which is removing the gear lever from the gearbox by pulling off the small rubber cover and removing a circlip that holds the gear lever in place. Or the happy method of unbolting the top cover of the gearbox, which means the entire top comes off and the linkage arrangement can be accessed. So obviously I chose the difficult route and I did this for a specific reason. I wanted to check the plastic cup at the bottom of the gear lever stick. I just wanted to know if this was still in good condition. This just required six 6mm bolts to be removed. Also be careful you don't damage the gasket when removing the cover. So once everything was removed I chucked a rag over it just to keep the dust out. Next was to remove the draft shaft. Now I don't know if this is strictly necessary, but I cleaned a small area and marked with a center punch some alignment points so that everything can go back in the same orientation it came out. I cracked the four draft shaft bolts loose with two spanners and after that whipped them out with an impact wrench. Before unbolting the center bearing, I marked its position with a permanent marker so that I know exactly where to bolt it back. So, remove the two bolts, uh, just remember don't let it fall on your head when the last one comes out. And uh, basically I just pulled the drive shaft out of the gearbox and it should slide right out relatively easily. You'll notice I loosely screwed the bolts back into place for the center bearing and at the flange of the differential. I'm sure you know how irritating it is when you lose your nuts and bolts. Next up is removing the slave cylinder. Two bolts to remove the cylinder and one bolt to remove the bracket that supports the hydraulic pipe. After that, I removed the four bolts at the rear gearbox mounting bracket. At this point, I also unplugged and removed the reverse and the speed sensor wiring. If you're battling to see this, uh, just raise your head a little near the top of the screen. Maybe you'll get a better view. Now, before removing the cross member underneath the gearbox, we need to prop up the motor so that when we remove this cross member, the whole flipping thing doesn't fall out the back. So I did this by jacking up the gearbox slightly, you can kind of see it here, and uh, sliding a few pieces of wood in the gap between the sump or the oil pan and the cross member underneath the engine. This way, when we drop the gearbox support, the engine and gearbox assembly are supported.
Now I remove the crossmember gearbox support by removing two bolts either side of the frame. And with a bit of not so gentle persuasion, it fell right out. With the gearbox mounting a cross member out of the way, I lowered the jack slowly and let the engine rest on the wood. Now with this jack out of the way, uh, there is a bit more space to work and it's just a matter of removing all the bolts between the bell housing and the engine block. I say all, but I actually left one bolt either side of the gearbox loosely in place. That's just to hold everything up while I get the jack back into place and underneath the gearbox to support it. Some bolts are more difficult to get to than others, but just work your way around slowly, you'll get there. With the jack back in place, I removed the final two bolts. I also had to remove an exhaust support bracket. This supports the bottom of the headers and is bolted on the driver's side. And you can see me working on this now. Checking the jack height, I proceeded to start wiggling and after a few back and forths and a few choice words in my head, it was finally free. Just be careful when you lower it that it doesn't snag on any of the wiring. Removing the clutch assembly is fairly simple. Once the six bolts holding the pressure plate are removed, all that is left to do is to pry the pressure plate from the pins that index it onto the flywheel and that's it. It should just come right off. Make sure you do the right thing now and use only your best snap-on screwdrivers for this. Now, again, the right thing to do is to remove the flywheel and send it in for skimming. So, of course, I left it in place and I just used a bit of sandpaper. Should be fine. In all seriousness, uh, after giving the entire surface a quick scuff with a flatting block, it looked not too bad. Still pretty flat, nice, consistent finish, no funny marks. Now, what you're probably thinking to yourself while you're sanding your life away, staring at the spigot bearing. Hmm, I'm sure this will be fine. No, it won't. Next problem, how the f*** am I going to get this thing out? I don't have a puller. Uh, it'll be fine. No, it won't. So, for around 70 bucks, around 4 US dollars, guys, just put a new bearing in. It's definitely worth the effort. So what I ended up doing was quickly whipping up one of those get them out fast tools and it gently came out the hole. Sorted. Again, the right thing to do here is press the bearing back into place. So of course I just hit it in with a hammer. Although to my defense I did use a copper mallet so that I didn't damage my socket. Next up, uh, we need to clean the splines on the gearbox input shaft. A quick wire brush did the trick. Likewise, a quick clean of the bell housing mating surface, some benzene and a bit of sandpaper just worked fine. I washed out the bell housing with some brake clean and brushed it out with a paintbrush. make sure you check the clutch plate slides onto the splines easily before you put this whole lot together. Once that's done, I greased up the ball for the fork, the part where the release bearing slides, 
and the splines. Now, don't use too much grease here. This is one of those cases where a dab will do. Any more than too much could potentially get onto the clutch plate and that's gonna be a bad thing. After fitting the release bearing, I cleaned the flywheel with some benzene just to remove any oil. Also, make sure to clean the pressure plate running surface to remove any oil. The clutch kit I bought comes with an alignment tool to center the clutch plate. So I stuck it in, then aligned the pressure plate with the indexing pins on the flywheel and bolted it up. Now, you want to make sure that you tighten these up evenly across all six bolts. So, one bolt at a time, one bolt a little bit first, then the next bolt on the opposite side a little bit, and so on and so forth. Once that's done, these bolts need to be tightened to a specific torque setting. So just check your service manual for the correct amount for your specific vehicle. Now it's just a matter of sliding the gearbox back into place. And the cradle I made for the gearbox, that's the thing bolted to the top of the jack, really made the job of getting the gearbox off and back into place a whole lot easier for a one-man job. It was definitely worth the extra effort. So after a bit of pushing and wiggling again, I managed to get it back in. And that's pretty much what it takes to change the clutch. Now, <laughs> there is a couple more things to do. We just need to bolt the gearbox back in, bolt the cross member back in, and connect up all the wiring, and, and don't forget to put in the drive shaft. Now, you're not gonna be going anywhere if that thing's not connected, and, and all that good stuff. Uh, it's pretty much opposite to what we did when we took it all apart. And I bet you guys, if you take all of those bolts and turn them opposite to the way that you took them out, they'll go back in. I'm telling you, they will. They, they will. Okay, um, we also want to take the vehicle for a test drive just to check that everything is working correctly. Bear this in mind as well, we need the clutch to break in. And uh, just stick to your manufacturer's specifications on exactly how to break in the kit that you purchased. Generally, it's about 500 to 1,000 kilometers. And that's, that's referred to as maybe town driving where the clutch is actuating or it's engaging and disengaging. It doesn't mean go and drive 1,000 kilometers and use the clutch three times, uh, three times and um, you know that type of thing it's just <laughs> that's not what they mean break in and definitely don't go and flip and lay rubber down on the ground you're probably going to end up overheating it and glazing a brand new clutch and then it's buggered another thing to keep in mind is you may need to reset the free play on your pedal inside the cab inside the footwell now uh, i had a look in of course i did mine i had a look in my toyota handbook and it tells you exactly uh, what the free play should should be so just check your book and set yours accordingly guys uh, that is it please like subscribe comment on the video uh, it's always nice to hear from you and yeah i guess we'll see you in the next one <laughs> cheers